Welcome everybody to our workshop semester in the Holy Spirit. We are in session number six. So excited to spend the next few minutes with you. I want to encourage you to pull out your workshop notes to follow along. There's a, a lot of ground we'll cover, a lot of scriptures we'll look at, and it would be great if you could follow along if it's possible. In this particular session, we're going to be talking about the baptism the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, an amazing topic. And I can hardly wait to jump into it with you. So let's just take the big jump off the diving board into the deep end. Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three and in verse 11, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with the water of repentance, but after me there's going to come someone who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this is one of the most provocative, profound, and heart-hitting statements used in the entire scriptures. Because if you believe in words and you believe in the scriptures, this is a profound statement that you would be immersed in the Holy Spirit. You'd be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, the people listening to John the Baptist that day weren't uh, ignorant of who the Holy Spirit was. They knew that he was an active part of the entire Old Testament. They knew of the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters and taking the words that the Father had spoken and then bringing them into reality. They knew of the anointing of the Holy Spirit coming on people. They knew that the prophet, priest, and king had this supernatural clothing, this supernatural mantle of God's Spirit working on them. And so they knew the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. They knew him as God, God, the Holy Spirit. Well, it's one thing for the Holy Spirit to come on you. Some amazing things happen and then that's done. That's over. It's one thing to actually look back to the Old Testament uh, superheroes and see God work with them. But there's something about our fallen human nature or living in a fallen world where we tend towards diminishing what God would do with us, what God would do with us. What I love is that John the Baptist is correlating that there is such a generality, this is such a universality of, I will baptize you with water. I will baptize you with water, which was all inclusive that everybody would need to be and should be baptized with water. That's John the Baptist's heart in this whole scenario, but he says, there's somebody coming after me that's gonna make this Holy Spirit, you read about in the Old Testament, empowering people, giving them knowledge, giving them abilities, giving them vocal capacity to communicate God into the earth and his plans to be fulfilled, that the same Holy Spirit doing all of that in the same way I'm baptizing people with water, which again is all inclusive, everybody is now accessible or they can access the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's now gonna be made, made available so that we are baptized. Jesus will baptize people in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then Jesus later uses this expression. So he uses the expression that John the Baptist gave after his death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus is raised from the dead now, and he is giving his last commissioning statements to his followers. And when he does, this is what he says. Right before he ascends on high, leaves the planet, right before he ascends, this is what he says. In Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts chapter 1, it says, In being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for truly John, John the Baptist, truly John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days 
from now. So Jesus uses the exact referencing of John the Baptist and saying this promise of the Father, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is now going to be a part of your life. And don't go fulfill the plan of God until you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so this whole promise, this whole prophetic uh, experience is about to happen in one chapter later in Acts chapter two, it all unfolds on this day of Pentecost. And it says in Acts chapter two and verse one, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there's a sound like the blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So if just for a moment, any prejudice, any kind of bias you have around this speaking in tongues, let's set that aside. I want to specifically talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I'd like to talk about it without including or emphasizing speaking in tongues at this juncture. So if for a moment, just consider that John the Baptist said that Jesus who is coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus acknowledged that, that John the Baptist had said. And then he said, this promise of the father is about to come on you. And this happens in Acts chapter two. And they are all filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. They are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And yes, they did speak with tongues here. And we're going to be talking a lot about this blessed uh, opportunity and endowment, this devotional uh, gift or devotional blessing that is available to every believer. We're going to be talking about that. But for the sake of simplicity or clarity, I want to take the baptism of the Holy Spirit and separate it out from all of the benefits or evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I first just want you to realize there's so much more in God. There is so much more available concerning the Holy Spirit than what any of us have actually fully engaged. So again, we see this phrase, this baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, this promise of the Father to be again filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we see in Acts chapter 10, I want you to follow along. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell. <laughs> I think that's a hilarious word to use in the context of the Holy Spirit. He fell. He fell upon all those that heard the word. What's it like to have God fall on you? That's an amazing question. <laughs> and they were all in that moment, they heard the words of Peter and they were all subjects to the falling upon of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those that heard the word. And it says in those of the circumcision or the Jewish people, those who hadn't yet converted to Christianity, all of those of the circumcision or Judaism who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So again, if we take these terms, we see that there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that is synonymous with the promise of the Father, which is synonymous with being filled with the Spirit, which is synonymous with the Holy Spirit falling or he fell on them, which is synonymous with the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is synonymous with him being poured out, him being poured out. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit actually is very, very broad. There's a lot to consider when you think about what it's like for God to invade human experience and human personality and become a part of executing all that God has planned in this earth. Now, we just read in Acts chapter 10 about when Peter speaking, all of this begins to happen. But just for a minute, just for a minute. I want you to hear Peter as he reflects back on that moment, reflects what happened. In Acts chapter 11, 
One chapter later, after all of these uh, experienced the amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he fell on them. The Gentiles are present, the Jews are present, and the Jews who believe, they're astonished, can't believe that a Gentile, a non-Jew, could actually encounter the Holy Spirit like that. So as Peter reflects back one chapter later, this is what he says in Acts 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and then he says this, as upon us at the beginning. So notice that in Acts chapter 2, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, they begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance. But for the sake of emphasizing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that event in Acts chapter 2 was reflected by Jesus to be what John the Baptist had said, which was that I'm baptizing you with water, but you soon will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Peter now says in Acts chapter 2, when I received the original outpouring of the Holy Spirit, today in Acts chapter 10, when the Gentiles experience this, the Jews are astonished of what just happened as the Holy Spirit filled uh, them up. He was poured out upon them. They all received the gift of the Holy Spirit. When that happened, when that happened, Peter says the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. So in Acts chapter 2, when it says, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that would be synonymous with this phrase that he fell upon them. Peter clearly is directing that what happened in Acts chapter 2 was not, was not a once and for all experience. In other words, whenever the baptism of the Holy Spirit came into the earth, it did not finish everything that needed to ever happen for the church concerning the Holy Spirit in that moment. The fact that it happened again in Acts chapter 10 when they are all together with the Gentiles and they all receive, and Peter says, came upon them like it came upon us in the beginning shows that God did not do it once and for all when the church, the early church, was launched in Acts chapter 2. This is something that proves out that this baptism of the Holy Spirit, his falling upon the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit are all, are all available for every believer to encounter, not as some kind of academic doctrinal, well, we believe that happened back when the church was first originated back in Acts chapter 2, but never since then does anybody get filled with the Holy Spirit or that anybody is baptized, immersed, and so on. No. This is something that is available to every believer in every generation. Now, again, we're looking at these terms and talking about these terms. And I, I want to continue to drill into this phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the synonymous phrases, because they'll keep coming back to us as we walk through this topic. And it's important if you're going to study the Holy Spirit that you do not, you do not exclude this whole move of God for the human encounter of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 2, 4, again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is called being filled with the Spirit. In Acts 10, it talks about the Holy Spirit falling on them or he fell on them. In Acts chapter 11, it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit again. And then in Acts chapter 11, God gave them the same gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We also see the promise of the Holy Spirit. So all of this is a reference to the same synonymous idea. So we have several expressions, several expressions. In fact, even as we look through the text, Acts chapter 2, it says that they would receive the Holy Spirit. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit falling on. This is a reference to the baptism of. This is a, a reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit. So receiving the Holy Spirit would again be synonymous. The Bible tells us in reference to Luke 24, 49, that they would be clothed with power from on high. So to be clothed with power is another one of these synonymous phrase, phrases. So what I want to now do is transition just a, a, a second and think about how this Holy Spirit activity is not a once in a lifetime experience or encounter. 
any more than it's the church that had it one time in Acts chapter two. And for the rest of the history of the church, we never encounter this again. It's kind of like, oh yeah, that's just in the archives of history. It's just kind of something that, that we reflect back on. And today we have it. Nobody really experiences anything. Nobody really has any kind of unique empowerments. Nobody has any uh, unique immersions or endowments of power. It's just, you know, that happened back Acts chapter two, 2000 years ago. And so in the archives of history of the church, we just kind of say that that happened. No, 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 <laughs> no. That isn't something we relegate just to 2000 years ago. This is something that God intends for every generation and every believer to walk in, to encounter, to have. And in fact, not just for every generation, but even you as an individual, you can have more than a one time immersion in the Holy Spirit. As an example, in Acts chapter two, we again reflect on this uh, initial outpouring where on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place and it says they were all filled. Verse four, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit as he began to give them divine utterances. That's Acts chapter two. Well, two chapters later in Acts chapter four, the same people, the same people are gathered together. They're praying in one place. This is Acts 4.31. And as they're assembled, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word with boldness. So they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're the same people that in Acts chapter two were filled with the Spirit. And so what that gives you the idea of is that each individual believer can live in a constant filling and refilling. In Ephesians chapter five at verse 18, the scripture, this is the apostle Paul writing, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. The actual language in the Greek is a constancy, be being Filled. In other words, God intends that we are constantly being filled. Well, if we use the synonymous phrases that we are constantly being immersed in the Holy Spirit, we're constantly walking in a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we're constantly living in the gift or the promise of the Holy Spirit. We're constantly living in the clothing of this endowment of power, the clothing of the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. So, Let's start looking into what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What is the baptism? Well, the word baptism or baptized, the word itself means to immerse, to immerse. It means to be saturated or to be fully pervaded or to be thoroughly permeated with. So what would it be like? What would it be like? This is the question. What would it be like to be baptized, immersed, saturated or fully pervaded or thoroughly permeated with the Holy Spirit? I love that question. I'll say it again. I'll ask it. What would it be like to be baptized, immersed, saturated, fully pervaded or thoroughly permeated with the Holy Spirit? Because this depicts vividly the idea of a person or an assembly being entirely enveloped in the reality of the Holy Spirit. Since to be baptized in water means to be immersed in or plunged under, even drenched and soaked with, then to be baptized with the Holy Spirit cannot mean less than that. In immersion, no part of the body is left untouched. Everything goes under. So with the spirit's baptism, the whole being of a person, spirit, soul, and body is endued with the spirit of God. And likewise, in the community of those who are so baptized, there is a profound effect that impacts total life, every part of the community. Individuals and communities who get touched, touched in every area by the presence and the power of God can be said of them, that they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the idea of being filled or full points to the completeness of the Spirit's immersion. It relates to the entirety of man. That's to say that inwardly, inwardly, we are to be pervaded by the Holy Spirit, even as the sound of a mighty wind fills the entire house of Acts chapter two and signifies that in that moment, there wasn't any part of that room that 
somehow did not become invaded by the Spirit of God. Every part of that room, that when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, that we're actually so pervaded, so filled, that every room, every nook, every cranny, every aspect of our lives, whether that's individually, whether it's spirit, soul, and body in us, or whether it's the communal life that God intends for us to live together, it is all touched and, in fact, overwhelmed by God's presence. So this is what it means to be flooded in one's being with God's presence. This is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So this serves to show that in a concept, baptism or immersion, saturation, being fully uh, pervaded or thoroughly permeated with the Holy Spirit is complex in the richness of its meaning. So let's consider this. If we are to be baptized, immersed, saturated, fully pervaded, thoroughly permeated, then in whom, in whom are we immersed in? In whom are we thoroughly permeated with? Well, we're talking about the baptism with or the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Just like if you're baptized in water, that you are actually in the Water. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit, you're baptized in this person of the Holy Spirit. Well, in previous sessions, we've talked about that he is a person. So what we're saying in essence is that when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are baptized with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. You're immersed in him. You're fully pervaded by him. You're permeated with him. The spirit of might, spirit of might or power, dominion, the spirit of might you are immersed. You are fully pervaded. You're thoroughly permeated with. We find that he is our parakletos. This is the Greek word for comforter. He's our comforter, counselor, strengthener, standby, advocate, helper, intercessor. And when we get baptized in him, we are immersed, saturated, fully pervaded, and thoroughly permeated with him. When we talk about peace, he's the peace that passes understanding. He's spiritual rest. He's the anointing behind all miracles. You need a miracle when you're living in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you're living in the fullness of the Spirit, the promise of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can anticipate that you should be and God designed you to be to be saturated with him, per, permeated by him, that your whole being is fully pervaded. So that means when we talk about the anointing behind miracles, this is the person that you are immersed in. Think about that. And then things like hope and vision. This is the Holy Spirit's work in our life, faith and conviction that the Holy Spirit's the one who inspires us to believe, who causes us to reach out beyond what our own natural limitations would, would say. We would be able to believe what God has promised when it comes to passion and purpose, when we think about all the nature of God, like his omnipotence. There's nothing he can't do, his omniscience. There isn't anything he doesn't know, the omnipresence. There's nowhere he hasn't been. We're talking about being immersed, saturated, fully pervaded, thoroughly permeated with him. We're talking about grace and unqualified acceptance. We're talking about forgiveness and unending mercy. We're talking about love that is personified. So when we talk about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about an invasion internally and an overwhelming externally of this person that is God, the third person of the Godhead, that Jesus said, you've got to wait in Jerusalem, wait until you've been endued with power from on high. Now, we've said this before, but I think it's important to say it again, that if you were one of the disciples and you heard Jesus say, it's better for you that I go away, it's better for you that I go away, I'll send you another comforter, you'd be like, what? I left everything to follow you. And then on this day that in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. He's already been raised from the dead and he's having his last words commissioning with the disciples. And as he does... He says, don't leave Jerusalem until you've been endued on, with power from on high. Now think about this. Think about this. If these disciples walk with Jesus for three and a half years, can you imagine the theological degrees? <laughs> can you imagine the academic learning that they would have gotten just by being around him and understanding things, listening to him talk, listening to him size up? That, can you imagine? Can you imagine? 
And yet Jesus himself says, don't leave Jerusalem just with your degree, your certification, your three and a half years of hanging with me. You've got to have the Holy Spirit immersion in your life for the church that I'm about to launch to be effective. In other words, every piece of this great commission catalyzes on this immersion. Often in Christianity, we have a tendency to read what Jesus said do without engaging the power that he said to do it with. To go do something without the power that actually causes it to happen. It'd be like if I said, go turn the lights on and you're trying to figure out how to get the lights on without using electricity or the power in the room. Well, you would be horribly frustrated. And here's another piece of that. Everybody who is looking for light around you and depending on you to bring light are going to be disappointed as well. They will continue to sit in darkness. Everything that Jesus wants the local church and the universal church and the Great Commission to fulfill, everything God desires for you as an individual comes back to this baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to talk to you about numbers of people, just numbers of people who said that they had experienced a baptism in the Holy Spirit, a baptism. Sometimes as people share their stories, sometimes as they go back and remember what God did in them and through them that kind of set them up for where they're walking with God today, sometimes they would have physical manifestations that wrecked them. And when any time we talk about, and you're going to need to know this, any time we talk about God manifesting so that there's a physical interaction or a physical sign, I just need you to know, if you're really going to be impacted by a physical manifestation of God, like if you feel something, see something, if there's a sign and a wonder externally to your five physical senses, what causes that to change you uh, deeply is that it goes inside your heart and in your heart, in your spirit, in your soul, you are processing this as something much richer than just a physical evidential thing. So when people often talk about that they had a physical experience, please, please, please dive deeper from what you physically hear about and think what kind of an intimacy interaction, what kind of a, an immersion in him, what kind of a relationship with him would create such a physical manifestation. So let's don't get enamored by the physical manifestation. Let's get enamored by what caused any physical manifestation. Manifestation. It's important to know. So people talk about when they have reflected their story of personal baptisms in the Holy Spirit, that they're sometimes are physical manifestations, sometimes they're strong emotional reactions. And in my own correspondence and hearing stories of friends and studying a lot of various people, what I find is that often there are these massive references to a constant sense of well-being, a well-being that cannot be defined, cannot be described, something that overwhelms people. Sometimes people will say things like, it was just like being flooded with joy. Somebody said, I started to praise God in a new language. I, I had never learned it. I, I never had that language. But something inside my spirit caused me to feel like I'm taking wings. I'm soaring soaring heavenward on a poem. That's actually what somebody said. So another person said, I just started laughing. It was a strange thing to do, but I just wanted to laugh and laugh. And the, the way you do when you feel so good, you just can't talk about it. I held my sides, they said, and I just laughed until I doubled over. Then I'd stop for a while and then I'd start again laughing and laughing. This was just the initial interaction with him. If he is joy unspeakable and full of glory. If he is joy unspeakable, I'd guess that there's times as you have this immersion, saturation, permeation, that you're going to have an intense joy or intense peace. Somebody else said for the first time, I discovered to myself why the disciples were accused of being drunk, <laughs> drunk at Pentecost. That's the way I felt at my own Pentecost in the highest spirits, just drunk with joy, drunk with joy. Now, 
often what, what people do is they'll hear these stories and they become enamored with them. And then they think that the Holy Spirit is laughter or the Holy Spirit is quote unquote, some kind of drunkenness. I just want you to know the Holy Spirit is not laughter and he's not drunkenness. He is a person. And when you interact with him, there's going to be a reaction. There's going to be something that begins to happen in you, through you, around you. This is not to get captured by a particular way somebody experienced him, but to actually say, I want to know him. This is him. This is the Holy Spirit. Others would say things like this. With me, there was peace, just a wonderful, quiet, steady and deep peace. There are people that testified that they wanted to pray more, that they tried to ex uh, exclude worldliness from their lives. They prayed for cleansing and consecration more than they ever had before. Just a hunger to walk with God in the way that they know that God's grace would empower them to do. Some would, would actually spend time acknowledging the reign of Christ in their soul and in their lives, a sense of dominion rising up in them. Others that were baptized, they, they were involved in a growing relationship with God like they had never pursued or known before. For some, there was restoration and heart searching. They looked inside themselves and around their relationships and they wanted to bring uh, a conciliation. They wanted to bring uh, restitution and heart to that relationship, forgiveness. Many would say that they just made him so happy and so free. Some said that they were much more committed to evangelism than they had ever been before. Some understood the infilling to be the empowerment for service, and they began to live a life of service to God's kingdom like they had never done before. And for Many, 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 they will emphasize how that the spirit baptism, this one moment in time, it wasn't before this time. And at the moment of this time, they altered their priorities. And it wasn't just, I got to do better. There was an empowerment. There was a courage. There was a craving and a boldness to do what God had called them to do. Throughout the Bible, we have examples of this. For instance, Peter Peter's the guy who denied the Lord. He was on Jesus' staff. He denies the Lord three times. Three times. Denies the Lord three times. And then after he's baptized with the Holy Spirit, he immediately stands in front of thousands of people with no regard of consequences, knowing that he could immediately be killed for what he believes because he is aligning himself with Jesus. In other words, I want you to notice the baptism of the Holy Spirit eliminated his shame the shame of what he did before and eliminated the shame for what he stands for today. You know what it's like for somebody to contest what you believe or to mock, make fun of it. Often you feel this undercurrent of shame. Peter didn't feel that shame anymore. James, who's the brother of Jesus, another example. He was so noncommittal early in his relationship with Jesus, trying to figure out who's this brother of mine and what's up with this. When he gets baptized with the Holy Spirit, he becomes the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem that ended up having upwards of 30 to 100,000 members in it in Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. And this dude goes killing. He was a Jewish uh, elitist. He wanted to kill all these Christians. And he was literally physically killing people, killing Christians, stoning people who actually believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. He goes from doing that to when he gets filled with the Holy Spirit, he can be so empowered, so emboldened that he stands in front of the high priest and he shares his love for Christ. He activates miracles. He seems to always have the mind of Christ to be able to do what he needs to do. And, and we ask the question, what do, all, what do all these have in common? They were all impacted inside and out through this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when a person receives this experience, they're going to come into a service of power that was never there before, but now then is there and compelling them to rise up. 
There are multiple biographies that abound in the instances of men who have worked along as the best they could, just trying, trying so hard until one day they were led to this experience, this encounter with the Holy Spirit for which he immerses them. And they find that as they seek him and they end up obtaining and from that hour, from that time, there comes into their soul this new power, into their heart, this new power, their consciousness, this new power that utterly transforms them down into their very character. And some of these folks who were ministers and evangelists, mission workers, children's church teachers, their fathers and mothers and personal workers, etc. And what they find is what they had in them before doesn't even compare to what they have afterwards. And what they have afterwards in their expanded vision for a relationship with God, in for their attachment and their bond and what has happened to them mir miraculously, what they say is that I would never, I would never want to go back to the way it was before. The confidence that they stepped into. Now let me just say, as I kind of began a little bit ago, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not supposed to be limited to just one evidence. There are many in Christianity that are just so blessed, and I get it, I totally get it, because I actually, as a tongue talker, I speak in these unknown tongues. I like to call them spiritual languages because there is a, an ease and it's more common to talk in that kind of verbiage in our modern culture than to talk about speaking in an unknown tongue. If I ask somebody who speaks Spanish and I'm trying to figure out you know, what language they're speaking, maybe this, I think it could be French or, uh, or maybe I, I think that it could be you know, uh, Russian, I, whatever. I don't know what it is. So I, I, don't, I would never ask somebody, what tongue are you speaking in? So that, that whole way of talking is a bit archaic for me. So I prefer calling speaking in an unknown tongue just a spiritual language, a language that the Holy Spirit inspires. I speak in tongues. I speak in tongues a lot because of how impactful it has been as an experience. To It's kind of a portal, kind of a, a medium for me to connect with God in ways that nothing else, that doesn't mean other things don't provide its own uh, beauty and wonder. But for me, speaking in tongues is profoundly effective in my walk with God, profoundly effective. So I get why many people, when they talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they want to tie it directly to speaking in tongues. And then speaking in tongues becomes the only evidence ever talked about when the baptism of the Holy Spirit is presented. That's why I like to separate I like to separate all the benefits, all the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I like to separate that from the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a whole, because what we're talking about is not a gift that we use. We're talking about a person that we bond with, that we adventure life with, that we know, and that we have fulfillment and satisfaction because of the beauty and the wonder of who he is. So again, when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let's don't limit him to just one dimension, one place. Uh, I want us to keep moving as we think about all that he can bring into our lives. Now, I want to begin with modern day, modern day experiences, and I want to begin with my own, my own experience. My dad led me to faith in Christ when I was six years old. I can remember it like it was yesterday. So... He comes into our home and my mom and brother were gone doing something. And dad says, come here, I want, to, uh, I want to talk to you about something. So he asked me to sit across the table and this is really unusual because my dad never kind of went eyeball to eyeball giving me a man to man talk. And this wasn't a normal thing to, to mutually uh, invest or add to the conversation. Normally as a six year old kid, I was just ears, I was just listening and that was it. I can remember it just like it was yesterday. I'm sitting at this table and my dad asked me what I thought about Jesus. And then over the conversation ends up back and forth leading me, leading me to faith in Christ. We pray, I submit my heart to Jesus. And at that moment, I believe I'm born again. Well, now then fast forward. My mom and dad loved the word and they were so hungry 
for the Word of God that we, back in those days, pre-podcasts, we didn't have YouTube videos. There was none of the, the knowledge base that we know of today being available. That was not what we had access to in that day. So we would literally drive hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles to get in a conference or a seminar that would just teach us the Word of God. Now, when I say us, my mom and dad would do it. My brother and I, we were just long for the ride. All we knew is that mom and dad, they're all up in this stuff and we didn't have anything to compare it against. So for us, it was just normal. That's what you did in life. And I remember going to Jackson, Mississippi when I'm eight years old and there was one of these conferences they actually had a kid's area, a kid's area that you could go to and just uh, enjoy a, a kid's service. Well, push pause on that part of the story and let me tell you what was going on in my family. My mom had been hungering for God and she had uh, received her spiritual language and she had uh, in, engaged the Holy Spirit in ways that overwhelmed her. And so she had these prayer meetings that she would have in our house, and it was just setting up the environment for the Holy Spirit to, to just be present and for them to connect and enjoy Him. And they would worship and sing songs, and they would just minister to the Lord and minister to each other. And it was such a, a big deal that I would come in from from uh, school and I would go in to change clothes, get my old holy jeans on so I can get back out and play. And I remember just going in and out and, and it was such a, uh, an atmosphere in the room, in my house. You could feel it walking in the door. And so you'd tiptoe down the hall, tiptoe back out, but you could just sense this is something's different up in here. Something's different. Well, that's the environment that I've been around and I'm hearing my mom speak in these uh, spiritual languages, my dad speaking in these spiritual languages. Uh, we're going to churches that many of the people speak in spiritual languages. So when I'm eight, I'm in this kids church service and they're worshiping God and it just was so sweet. There was such peace there. Well, all of a sudden in that moment, in that moment, the Holy Spirit comes on my heart, and now today I understand it more than I did then, but comes on my mind. And as I receive, as I'm sitting there, there is such a sense of God's presence to me. I, I just was so aware of Him, and He began to commune with me. He began to talk with me about things. Now for me, that was where my spiritual languages began. I began, I, I had this prompting, you know, you can speak in tongues right now if you just step into it. And so I stepped into it and I just began to worship God in unknown tongues. Throughout my life, I've had many, many occasions where I have had spiritual leaders, spiritual fathers who have what we call laid hands, just a way of ministering to people, touching folks, um, you know, normally on your head or your shoulders, but ministering. And time and time again, I have encountered these immersions. Sometimes these immersions are uh, very physical or very experiential. And I do want to emphasize that any physical experience actually for me has originated deep within my heart, deep within my soul. It wasn't from the physical down into the heart. It was from the heart and then the physical began to express. There's times that I have encountered the Holy Spirit to such a degree that it was like electrical currents running through my veins, running through my body. And it came in one of the ways others have described it. It came in wave after wave. I've encountered things. I've, I've experienced things in the Holy Spirit that are, for me, quite profound. And one of the things that I have set my heart to do is to always be leaning in and expecting to know Him. And the beauty and wonder for me is not the feelings, not the physical manifestations or the emotions. For me, what's so wonderful is simply getting to know Him. Now, it's difficult to separate all of that because when you know Him, you're going to have an emotion. When you know Him and He is working through your life, there's going to be things that physically begin to happen. Now, I don't want to overstate the physical because often for me, it is not the physical. It's just the contact and, and connection, the bond, the attachment that I have experienced with Him. 
And so my encouragement is as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just keep your heart where you are hungering, you're desiring who he is as a person. And you've got to eliminate your prejudices, your biases, and all of the cautions that keep people from moving into him and experiencing him and begin to say, you know what, Lord, I want all that you have for me. That's period. I want all that you have for me and I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do. Obviously, as Christians, we want to make sure that any kind of quote unquote manifestation that it is aligned or that it is mirrored from scripture we want to make sure that, you know, it's not just random experiences. We want to make sure that we are uh, in the safety of Scripture and what the Bible says is possible to happen. And so sometimes you have to have the wisdom of other spiritual fathers to be able to encourage you or, or say, you know what, I would caution you about an experience that's moving in that direction. Again, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being very real, very honest with you. But if you're going to encounter the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to be a person who is not going to be prejudiced or biased against him. Now, throughout church history, there's many people, many people who have had profound baptism experiences in the Holy Spirit. Profound. Charles Finney, one of the great revivalists of uh, the 17 and 1800s. This guy is just, he's an amazing figure in Christianity, an evangelist. He's the founder of Oberlin College. And he talks about this face-to-face -face encounter with Christ he had. Now, now listen, as I, I talk to you about what he said, I quote it, I received a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit without any recollection, any recollection that I had ever heard such a thing mentioned by any person in the world. I love that. This is so fresh. He's never even heard anybody talk about this. And he says, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. I wept aloud with joy and love. And I don't know. I don't know. But I should say I literally bellowed out the unutterable gushings of my heart. These waves came over me and over me, one after the other, until I recollect I cried out, I shall die if these waves continue to pass over me. And yet I had no fear of death. Frank Bartleman, who is one of the leaders of the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s, he writes this, when my day of Pentecost was fully come in 1906, the channel was cleared. The living waters burst forth. The door of my service sprang open at the touch of the hand of a sovereign God. The spirit began to operate within me and in a new and mightier way. It was a distinct, fresh climax and development, an epical experience for me. I think both of those stories just cause you to take pause and make you think, oh, wow, those kind of things happen to people. Erwin Pring, this is a Lutheran pastor. He shares his experience. He says, how could a man think he was passing out the bread of life every Sunday and still remain so utterly hungry himself? I was empty and I knew it. This was the end of the line. He continues, there are uh, all at once, there all at once came a voice that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere. And he says, the gift is already yours. Reach out and take it. And so praying reached out. He opened his palms of his hands, his jaws tightened up and his mouth opened the best that he knew how. In an instant, there was a sudden shift of dimensions, he writes. And God became real. A spirit of pure love pervaded the church and the, drenched me like rain. He was beating in my heart, flowing through my blood, breathing in my lungs and thinking in my brain. And every cell in my body, every nerve in tingled with the fire of his presence. Larry Tomczak, he's a Roman Catholic layman and writer. He says this, as thanksgiving and praise erupted from within, a profound sense of God's presence began to well up in me. I felt the rapture of exultant joy, the joy of the Lord surging through me. And the more profuse my praise, the more intense became my desire to magnify the name of my Savior. 
I grew impatient with the inadequacy of the English language to fully express all that I was feeling and how much I could not restrain my tongue and my lips began to stammer and a language hopped, skipped and somersaulted from my mouth. The language was foreign to my ears, a heavenly language only God would understand. It was praise that had surged through my whole being to seek expression through the Holy Spirit in a new transcendence. Amazing. How about Graham Polking, uh, Polkingham? He's an Episcopal Church of the Redeemer pastor in Houston, Texas. And this is what he said. Rather soon after, I knelt all awareness of the men and their prayers of the room and even of myself was obliterated by the immense presence of God's power. He was unmistakably there. In a moment of breathless adoration, all my longing for love was satisfied. My inner being was swept clean of defilement from the tip of my toes to the top of my head as with a mighty rush of wind. And then another guy, Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody. He is the 19th century evangelist, pastor, founder of Moody Bible Institute. And a couple of ladies uh, came to him and began to interact with him about the Holy Spirit. And they said to him, you need, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Moody reflects, and this is what he writes, I need the power. I need the power. Why? I thought I had the power because I had the largest congregation in Chicago and there were many conversions and I was in a sense satisfied. So I want you to consider the population of Chicago, how big Chicago would be compared to other places. And he's got uh, a church where it is the largest congregation and has so many conversions, probably more conversions than any church in Chicago. And so these ladies say, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's thinking, what? So he's already saved. He's born again. No question about it. Heaven is his home. He knows Jesus. Yet this power of the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, there was some kind of barrier or wall, something that was in his mind that said, no, I can't go there. I'm not going to experience. I don't want, I have all I need. So after this moment where he's reflecting to himself, it says that these two ladies, he goes on to write, these two ladies, they poured out their hearts in prayer that I might receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. There came a great hunger into my soul, he writes. I began to cry out as I'd never did before. I really felt that I did not want to live if I could not have this power for service. Sometime later, Moody relates this, and I love this. One day in the city of New York, oh, what a day. I can't describe it. I seldom refer to it. It's almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience for which he never spoke for over 14 years. I can only say that God revealed himself to me and I had such an experience of his love that I had, had to ask him to stay his hand. That's wild. I went preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths and yet hundreds were converted. I would not be placed back before this blessed experience if you could give me all the world. There are a lot of others who talk about their experiences. For some, they talk about how they, they had had a sense of emptiness for some time and that God came in his fullness to them. There are a lot who talked about that this increased yearning to glorify God came and that God flooded them with his entire being through with his presence. And then there are others who talk about that they had experienced a deep desire to be used with God, to adventure with God, sharing the good news and the grace of God in Jesus because of how the Holy Spirit would come on them. So we need to ask this question again, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, we've looked at terms like being filled or being baptized, the promise of the Father and so on. But this should have a profoundly internal experience moving through us like wind or fire. It ought to move us internally. And I'm not talking about physical wind or physical fire. I'm talking metaphorically, but it ought to move us so that all the barriers are breached by the Holy Spirit causing our hearts to be tenderized and open. So even spirit, soul, and body, our conscious and subconscious de uh, depths, we become sensitized to his divine presence and activity. 
And as we describe these things, we can come back to saying all of these depict the various moves and person of the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, this is an invasion from without. The Spirit pours out. He's falling on. He's coming on. There's an immersion. There is a penetration, a permeation, because that's what it would be to be filled with the Spirit. So first, first, this expresses the movement of the Holy Spirit from on high coming to us and powerfully coming on people. Secondly, it depicts an ensuing uh, situation of people being so affected that they are enveloped in the reality of the Holy Spirit where things are so defined and real in him. And then third, it gives us pictures of the Holy Spirit moving within and activating all of our gifts, activating all of our service so that we can live in entirety in the existence of him. We can live and move and have our, our being in him. And so I, I'm just blown away by this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I again, want to, I want to give you, uh, as the pendulum swings, I want to give you another angle of thought. And that has to do with experience. Everything I'm talking about, and it's so difficult to talk about without showing the demonstration of an experience, and yet we're not supposed to be seeking an experience. We're supposed to be walking with Him. We, we aren't to seek mere experiences. We are to seek communion with the person of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, with any person, when it's real, it's experiential. <laughs> I just need you to know that when it's real, it's experiential. The Holy Spirit should be experienced, but experiences aren't our goal. Our goal is to know him and to be immersed in him. These immersions are not limited to just a one-time deal. They're supposed to be over and over and refillings and refillings. And listen, as, as amazing and powerful and beautiful as spiritual language, speaking in an unknown tongue is, as amazing as that is, let's don't ever diminish him, the Holy Spirit, to one blessing. He's so much greater. Now, again, this doesn't take away from the beauty and the wonder and the amazement and the, uh, the importance of responsibility where speaking in tongues is concerned. Let's just realize we're talking about the third person of the Godhead. Words cannot define him. This is what I mean when I say don't seek after the experience, seek after him. But as you come to know him, you're going to have an ongoing resume of varied experiences. And that's important again for you to know. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually for service in God's kingdom, not just for ecstasy. Now, I want you to just consider that, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is in a great discussion of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is defined as gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit. These gifts of the Holy Spirit that are to move through and be a part of the believer's life are not actually for you. They're not primarily for you. Actually, they are to be something that God uses with you to minister to other people. It's not, it's not something just. So sometimes when we read about all the joy and all the freedom, people begin to think, well, this baptism of the Holy Spirit's just kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a tool that I get high with. It's, it's my place of ecstasy. And I just want you to know the primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't to make you happy. And it's not just to make you, you, uh, make you have a moment of ecstasy. It's to make you useful. It's to give you efficiency in God's service. God doesn't just want to elevate the quality of your life with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but on the other side, how in the world can you be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not have your quality of life increase? But if that's your goal, you're going to have dysfunction in your walk with God. The primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to serve in the Great Commission and to adventure God's kingdom and purpose in this world. Again, there's a lot of emphasis that needs to be placed on how if God baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, it, this ought to, this ought to create a greater impact that you and I are having on this world. Now, a lot of times when you hear Christians talk about that they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
You can go weeks and months further into the future and notice that they have no more, no greater impact on their local church in ministry than they did before. I just want you to know the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for your church, for the kingdom of God to be expanded, to be advanced, to be able to move into greater things where the Great Commission is concerned. And so I just want to say you can receive a portion of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and really not experience all the depths of him. There is so much depth in him. There's so much to be known, so much to be seen. And I want to, I want to encourage you that yes, ecstasies and joy and peace are right in their places. They are good, they are beneficial, but that is not the purpose. And for me, I would rather, I would rather have a baptism in the Holy Spirit that empowers me to lead somebody to Christ than to have all the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the rest of my life that just causes me to sit around in ecstasies. So when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, don't try to figure out how you just, and this is so powerful, just grab onto this. This isn't so you can just have another Bible study or prayer meeting to enjoy your Holy Spirit gifting and, and immersion. I, I want you to see that the purpose is to go into all the world. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to change the world, not just gather around another believer and then compete against your previous experiences. And just everything is about, I just got to have another experience. Please, please, please don't reduce the goodness of the Holy Spirit down to just one more experience. In fact, what you're going to find is you go do the Great Commission, you'll have some pretty amazing times in God, but it'll be done aligned with the great commission, aligned with God's plan and his purpose in the earth. I want to give you very quickly some marked benefits and evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is where I want to set it up. Catch this. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, it says, therefore being exalted to the right hand of, of uh, God, the Father, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus poured out that which you now see and hear. So this is Acts chapter 2. This is after the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind. They begin to speak with tongues. This is at the heels of all these people from different nations hearing them speak in their own languages and seeing that they thought that they may be drunk. And then Peter gets up and preaches to them and people are getting saved. So I want you to hear this. So this is right after that. He says, he says that Jesus poured out that to which you now see and hear. So here, here's what I want you to know. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, there should be marked evidences that it's happened in your life. That it's happened in your life. Marked evidences. So what would be those evidences? And again, you're not seeking the evidence, you're seeking him. But as you walk with him, these evidences should be a part of your life to the degree that you could even be vetted for or out of because of these evidences either being in your life or not being in your life. In Acts chapter six, there was the selection of church leaders. And the Grecian widows were not being taken care of. They, they weren't being fed. They weren't being nurtured the way they should. And so the, the leaders of that day, the, the senior leaders, they put certain people, they selected certain people to be leaders in the church to dispense and distribute the goods to the Grecian widows. So this is one of the occasions when we see, for instance, a word called deacon. This, a deacon is a leader of teams, if you take it in modern terminology. But a deacon who's a leader of teams, you see a deacon, a deacon in the early church, and there is a criteria, there is a qualification, there's something that people should look at to determine whether an individual is ready to lead in a local church. Now keep in mind, this isn't legal, this isn't a law, this is just based on principles of wisdom, this is what you would want. So when a church first starts, like you're a church planter, well obviously you're gonna get, you know, be leading people to faith in Christ, and obviously you're gonna be developing people in the process, so you may have somebody you put as a leader who doesn't fit all the qualifications, but they should be visionary enough to see this is what God intends and the work of God's grace in my life is going to intentionally bring me to this level of maturity. So in Acts chapter 6, we see some of that criteria of a deacon. 
of a leader in a church. This is just reflecting evidences, reflecting that there was something that happened in their lives. So in Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, notice this, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, and then this, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So here's the question. If Peter says the Holy Spirit is what you now see and hear, and then a major vetting process for church leaders was that they would be full of the Holy Spirit, then you have to have some way to say these people have this and these people don't have this. These have it and these don't have it. Otherwise, why would you even put that they have to be people full of the Holy Spirit? So if you're full of the Holy Spirit, there ought to be evidences of that fullness. There ought to be a judgment be able to be made if you are full of the Spirit or if you're not. Now, keep in mind that you could be living, this is powerful too, you could be living in your Christian life and have this initial or first time baptism of the Holy Spirit and then through life and taking all the traumatic hits that sin and this world hits you with, you could have hardened your heart and the next thing you know, you're living carnally, you're living carnally, you're living dominated by immoral flesh and your flesh is crazy, you go fly off the handle all the time, you're nuts and the anxiety, you're always depressed, you, you just can't say anything nice, you, you're, you're living in addictive behaviors and so on. So keep in mind, keep in mind all of what I just said. You may have had a first time baptism in the Holy Spirit, but it's obvious that that did not retain or that refilling wasn't a part of your life because if somebody's being baptized or present tense, immersed in the Holy Spirit, that in fact their heart would live hot and they would be tender and there would be various evidences. So you can be full of the Holy Spirit once and then drift or you can get refilled over and over in your life. And this is the intent that we would stay hungry and stay in a place of getting refilled. So let me go over several, several evidences. I'm just giving you a whole list here, a bunch of them. Several evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, we said, let's not reduce the Holy Spirit down to one one characteristic or one gift or one evidence. Let's look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit separate from all the evidences. And now then we're rolling those evidences back into the discussion to see all that when he is immersing and permeating and invading, that when he's doing that in your life, these are the things that should happen and the scriptures behind it. For instance, you should have supernatural boldness. This is an evidence, supernatural boldness. In Acts 4, 31, they spoke the word of God. God with boldness on the heels of being baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled again. Number two, there should be unity and oneness in relationships. In Acts 4.32, right after the Holy Spirit shook the house, they were all filled. That it says that they were in a multitude of one heart and one soul. Same kind of thing happened in Acts chapter 2, right after the day of Pentecost, when the initial outpouring happened. It says they continually uh, were daily with one accord. One accord, that's Acts 2.46, in one accord. So consider that. And then number three... Your third evidence is generosity of heart. And these aren't in order or sequence of any kind. They're just thrown up for you to consider. There is a generosity of heart. When the immersion of the Holy Spirit happens, a generosity of heart. Acts 4.37, again, right after the Holy Spirit fell on them, that everybody brought their money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is, this is an exclusive power reaction to the Holy Spirit in your life. Number four, they possessed supernatural power. In Acts 4.33, with great power they gave witness. Acts 2.43, right after the day of Pentecost, many wonders and miraculous signs came. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. The word power is dunamis here. It's actually the word often used for miracles. John 14, 12 says, The works that I do will you do because I go to the Father. Greater works will you do. And he then correlates that to the Holy Spirit's activity in your life. In Mark 16, he says, These signs will follow them that believe. They'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues. They'll uh, be unhurt by any snakes or poison. 
the sick would recover. All of this is possessing supernatural power. So that doesn't mean that you just walk around with magic, waving a wand, and then all of a sudden, you know, there are all these spiritual laws, there's a lot of nuances to it, but nonetheless, you ought to expect the supernatural, miraculous power of God to be a part of your life if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit or living in a fresh baptism. There should be number five, favor and goodwill. Acts 4.33 says there was great grace upon them. There was a lot of loving kindness and favor and goodwill, the Amplified says. Number six, there was contentment. In Acts 4.34 it says, nor was there anybody among them who lacked. There was satisfaction. Number seven, they had great financial stewardship. Now then, we're not talking about the generosity side. We're talking about the management side. In Acts 6.1, when they needed somebody to look over, to look over the distribution of goods to the Grecian widows, they get these deacons, they pull these deacons together who are full of the Holy Spirit that they could appoint over the business. So apparently, whenever you're full of the Holy Spirit living in that baptism, you have this impact upon your own heart and mind so that you become a better financial steward. And then number eight, hunger for the Word of God. You ought to have a growing hunger for the Word of God. If you say you're baptized with the Holy Spirit because you have one evidence, and so now I'm going to pick on people who think they have everything in the Holy Spirit they need because they speak in tongues. I just want you to know that if you speak in tongues but you aren't hungry for the Word, you obviously did have some encounter with the Holy Spirit where He immersed you, but today you may not be living in any immersion at all. You're living on the gift that you received or that you yielded to back then, but God wants you to devote yourself to the apostles' teachings, that's Acts 2.42, that happened in the, uh, on the day of Pentecost, all that took place as a result. Number nine is that they prioritized new friendships and relationships. So something about the baptism of the Holy Spirit causes you to lean into people, causes you to devote yourself to fellowship, to caring about believers, so I would just say that if you're truly baptized with the Holy Spirit and living in that fresh baptism, you ought to want to be around the church community. You ought to want to be in groups. You ought to meet from house to house and make that a priority of your life. That is, that is an evidence that you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. I think that's important to know. Another evidence is the love of serving others. In Acts 2, again, after the day of Pentecost, it says they gave to anyone that had need. We see that as they served, as they were serving people, this serving came out of an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And then number 11, they love to pray and worship. They love to pray and worship. So when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you should be devoted to prayers and praising God. Something about your heart compels you to worship God, to spend time in prayer. That is one of the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number 12, the, the baptism caused you to love Organize church life, love the church, be an owner of the house, have a heart for the house. It says in Acts 2.46, again after the day of Pentecost, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. In Acts 4.35, after they received that filling, the second time, they laid their donations down at the apostles' feet, which were church leaders. So this means that they were involved. They loved the church. They were church-hearted, church-minded. Every decision that, that they make, once you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the decisions you make will get filtered through as a priority. How will this decision impact my church? How will it impact my church? Then number 13, spiritual life is perceived as awesome. The scripture says in Acts 2.43 that everybody was filled with awe. And so they had an unusual and full reverence of God. They were filled with awe. So your spiritual life ought to soar as a result of being freshly baptized of the Holy Spirit. There should be number 14, expressions of gladness and joy. It says in Acts 2 that they were glad and had sincere hearts. They were filled with joy. Acts 13 says they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Number 15, there should be simplicity of heart. These are evidences. Acts 2.46 talks about their simplicity of heart. There should be a steadfast diligence. That's number 16. It says they continued steadfastly. So perseverance ought to rise up in you as you are pursuing God's baptism and you're knowing him. You're living in relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number 17, they pursued conversations to Christ and love for people outside the faith. So evangelism was elevated. Their care for the lost became a passion. Acts 1.8 says that you'll be my witnesses after the Holy Spirit comes on you. Acts 4.33 says with power they delivered their testimonies. 
In Matthew 3, 11, he says, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire here is intense desire. As we read through the scripture, their intense desire, they didn't even care about their own lives. And because of that, in Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who could be saved. And number 18, should have dynamic faith. In Acts 6, 5, one of the deacons that they had vetted out who was full of the Holy Spirit, it says a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should intensify your faith, your boldness, your trust before God. A baptism in the Holy Spirit should create supernatural wisdom for you. Again, in Acts 6, when it talks about those deacons, they were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Nobody could resist the wisdom that they spake with. And then number 20, the ability to speak in a supernatural language. Acts 2, 4, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability. Mark 16, 17, these signs will follow. They speak with new tongues. Acts 10, 45, the gift of the Holy Spirit's poured out, heard them speak with tongues. Acts 19, 6, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues. I just want you to consider that speaking in tongues is one of the evidences, not the only, but one of the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some people will say, well, that's only for some people. Wait, wait, wait. Just like evangelism, diligence, simplicity of heart, expressions of gladness of joy, having dynamic faith, all of these things are characteristics that are necessary for every believer. They're not exclusive to one or two. They should be a part of every believer. Speaking in tongues would be that as well. And then number 21, a deep desire to live holy. Number 22, singing praise and melodies in the heart. Number 23, exuberant thankfulness. Number 24, mutual submission and tenderness of heart. When you're filled with the Spirit, you should be submitting to one another. Number 25, inspired preaching and speaking. That should become a part of you. Even if you're not called to preach, this should come into you and on you and for you. And then number 26, effective spiritual authority, effectiveness in living in the authority of the believer. 27, the nine operational gifts, they ought to show up in your life. Nine operational gifts, the uh, three gifts of power, like the word, I'm sorry, the, uh, the gift of faith, the working of miracles and the gifts of healings, the three gifts of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge and discerning of spirits, the three gifts of utterance or communication, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. All nine of those are ministry gifts. They are not devotional gifts. Devotional gift of speaking in tongues is different than the operational gift for which you are ministering now to somebody else. All of those should at various times show up in a person who's baptized with the Holy Spirit. So again, we've just gone over a whole list, a whole list of varied uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit or evidences. Uh, let me give you three more. 28 is intensified fruit of the Holy Spirit. 29 is resilient, energized hope. 30 is unusual freedom. All of these, all of these are evidences. So here's, here's what I want you to know. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a necessity for you. This is not a luxury for you. So don't, in your heart, have an attitude of that'd be great if that happened. No, this is a necessity for you. If it's a necessity, you will go after it. And that leads us back to our admonition every time we're together, and that is hungering for him, just hungering for him. So I ask you a question. Have you been immersed in the Holy Spirit? Have you been immersed in him? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit and these evidences just became a part of you? I'm not talking about you worked hard at them. I'm not talking about that you disciplined yourself for them. I'm talking about it is the grace work of the Holy Spirit upon your life. If you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, when's the last time you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? When's the last time you were filled up? When's the last time that you were walking in this freedom and in this power? So hunger for him. And the scripture again says to despise not, despise not these things of God. Prove them. Hold fast to that which is good. Earnestly desire these gifts and desire earnestly to prophesy and don't forbid these things. Just make sure they're earnest, uh, they, they're done decent and in order. Earnestly desire what God has. This responsibility is yours. So there's a necessity that God wants you to desire. Well, again, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit we're talking about. The next time we're together, we're going to talk about speaking in tongues and, and the spiritual language so that you can begin to understand what's that all about and how would somebody who desires that, how would they step into that and begin to enjoy that part of the Holy Spirit? 
I can hardly wait. So glad we spent this day together. It's an amazing time in the Word. God bless you guys.